Hi, everybody, and welcome to the most recent episode of How to Find, well, we, we call it the, the Let Me Introduce You series, that this episode is How to Find and Develop Your Writer's Voice. And as you can tell, I'm really excited about this because I've wanted to talk to Albert Flynn de Silva for a long time. I've admired him for a long time, and his approach is very beautiful helpful and productive. So we are gonna have a great conversation. We're gonna to be together for an hour today. And you won't see us, Albert and I talked about this, we're just about we're as zoomed out as, what's that? We're invisible. We're invisible, we're just about as zoomed out as everybody else is. I just can't do another Zoom meeting, I just can't. So what we're going to do is we're gonna ask you if you could, in the questions box, just tell me if you can hear the sound and if you can see the screen, you'll just see the screen. There's gonna be lots of slides. Great, Leslie, that's fabulous. I so appreciate it. Hi, Martha, I know you, all good. I love that, this is great. It's so always so fun for me to see all these names I recognize. So hi, everybody, that's perfect. That really helps, great, 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 great. Uh, hi, Nora. Hi. Oh, this is so sweet for me. Oh, hi, everybody. All right. So what we're going to do is be together for an hour. Everybody who registers will receive a copy of the recording. The recordings are really growing on the YouTube channel uh, that we have at the Memoir Project in my name at Marion Roach. And they're all there. And I think all but one is there. One didn't get recorded somehow. But we'll talk about all that later. For now, I really want to jump into today. So all you have to do is sit back and relax. And let me introduce us, and then we're going to get to this whole wonderful topic of the writer's voice. So I'm here. We're here together. I'm, I'm Marion Roach Smith. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the author of four mass market books, including The Memoir Project, a thoroughly non-standardized text for writing in life. And I used to work at the New York Times. I was a commenta commentator on NPR's All Things Considered. I had a longtime talk show on Sirius Satellite Radio. But my, my dearest love is memoir, and I've been teaching memoir for more than 25 years. The little book I wrote has been out for 13 years, reissued last year, republished by my publisher, and everything I teach, all the many classes I teach are located at marionroach.com, so come and see me there. And let me introduce you to my friend Albert, who is here with us today. He's a poet, a memoirist, a novelist, a speaker, and a workshop leader, and he's founded this wonderful system called Writing as a Path to Awakening, which is about the embodied, interconnected approach to creativity and writing. And it's a workshop, it's a retreat series, it's an interactive book project, and it's an online course experience. And it's from Albert Flynn de Silver. So hi, Albert, nice to see, well, hear you. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> hi, Marion, I am fantastic. And what a joy it is to be with you today. Well, I'm delighted. And I also can't not introduce you by showing this beautiful memoir that you wrote. I love this book. It is a piece of gorgeous literature and I always tell people to read it. So you got some real cred here, Albert, and we're well, uh, we're we're gonna try to get as much of it out of you as we can, your expertise today. So well you are so sweet to say so. I appreciate that. And um means a lot coming from you and all your experience. So thank you. Well you're absolutely welcome. Um, just give us a little background on this book, if you would. I want everybody to go buy this book and you and this book uh, to you know as soon as possible. But why don't you just give us a little, you know, give me a, a two minutes, a, a minute on on Beamish Boy, if you would. Oh, geez. Well, feel free to cut me off because <laughs> it's a long story. It's about um, 300 pages. Uh, but yeah, you know, I I grew up in a um, uh, challenging alcoholic abusive family and um, I grew up in the New York area and um, eventually moved out to California where I now live uh, but the the book kind of charts this journey of um, survival really overcoming mm -hmm. abuse and addiction and being saved by by art and and poetry eventually yes. writing it started with it basically started with some um, with art, because I grew up in a in a household that was there were lots of books and theater and photography and architecture and all that stuff around. Um, so that's kind of the the gist of it. Well, I think it was reading that that made me think of you um, about voice because we wonder how in an in a, a repressive or abusive or challenging or even in traditional or what some people think of as normal happy childhoods we ever 
find this idea of voice. And so mm -hmm. I really think this helps contextualize for people that under a variety of circumstances, you can get to voice. So true or false, Albert, you can locate, develop, and nurture a writer's voice. What do you think? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> totally. Good. And it's pretty essential for memoir, right? Yeah. Otherwise, we're um, it's going to be pretty boring. Yeah, and I think I get this question more than any other question in the thousands of people I've worked with and even in the most successful that I've worked with, the books that I have on my shelf. I've got 70-something books on my shelf of people that have worked with me. I've lost count of the op-eds and essays and all of that, um, the many, many classes and the people that have published. But even from the highly successful writers, I get questions about voice. And mm -hmm. so I think that we need to dig in and help people talk about it because this yes. audience are either considering writing they might be new to writing they might be years into writing but all of those writers including really well published writers have in common this struggle hearing it mm -hmm. accepting it nurturing it holding on to it this voice thing why do you think this struggle is as it is why do you think we're so questioning this idea of voice all the time uh I, god i think it's sort of hyped up so much in all the um the instruction literature and and really it's an intuitive thing you know it's not something that we can really learn from the outside mm -hmm. although that's what the culture would have us believe like go to the expert they'll teach you how to do voice right <laughs> that's where you'll find your voice um and the truth is that you can only find your voice by looking within and, you know, having the courage to, to stop and to be quiet and to get silent, to, um, to be in stillness. In my mm -hmm. experience, that's really the most, that's the best way to, to access the authenticity and the truth of your own voice. It takes a lot of courage. I think that's part of it too, is like, it's it's kind of harrowing, especially if you've had a difficult childhood or if you've, you know, you you you've come from a marginalized experience. So culturally, you've been excluded um, or abused. It's like I my voice has been taken from me. How do I how do I get that back? Mm. Um, but it is with us all along, and um, and it, it it you know writing is an incredible way to to reclaim it. Yeah. I don't know when it's appropriate to read this Ron Padgett poem about voice, but it's it's kind of a great lead in. Why don't you read the poem? You told me about it and, and you haven't read it to me yet. Why don't you tell me about it? And then we're going to break down. We're already, um, I, and I should have said, we're going to take questions at the end and I can't wait. We're going to leave lots of time for questions and people are already piling on saying, I don't really understand the meaning of a voice. So why don't you put the, put the roof over our heads with this poem and then we'll break this down and try to explain what we think voice is and how to cultivate it and how to keep it. So go right ahead, read to us, please. Okay, this is great. This, so this is from Ron Padgett, who's just a, an amazing poet from New York City. Uh, he worked as a poet in the schools in New York and, and was a big part of um, uh, the, the writers, uh, what's it called? Um, the Teachers and Writers Collaborative. Um, and this is a piece from the 1970s called Voice. I have always laughed when someone spoke of a young writer finding his voice. I took it literally. Had he lost his voice? Had he thrown it and had it not returned? <laughs> or perhaps they were referring to his newspaper, the village voice. He's trying to find his voice. What isn't funny is that so many young writers seem to have found this notion credible. They set off in search of their voice as if it were a single thing, a treasure difficult to find, but worth the effort. I never thought such a thing existed until recently. Now I know it does. I hope I never find mine. I wish to remain a phony the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of a great take on voice, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's really not all that. And um, and that it, it's just natural to who we are um, if we if we let go if we take a minute to let go of all that extraneous 
conceptualizing that we have about it from the outside. Well, I may, I loved your point earlier where you, you know, people will charge you a great deal of money to help you find yours, but it is an ex internal thing. I was listening to this beautiful interview yesterday with the Dalai Lama and, and the late uh, Desmond Tutu, and they mm. were talking to one another about joy. And, and the Dalai Lama was saying, you know, look at you, you're always laughing, Tutu, mm. you're always smiling, you're always happy. And they came to this agreement that Everybody, as particularly Americans, they they did kind of turn their attention on us and say, we think you can buy it. And um, they both maintain that it's within. And I think you're right about the voice being within and that we have to find it. So let's just deal with this right now. You have one. You have it in there or you have many or you have voices, um, not to get all you know scary on you. You've got some voices in there. <laughs> and the point is to try to define it. So as I try to make a word cloud, when I go online, when I look in the books I have, when I look at all the, the write, how-to writing texts I have, um, I found a, just a compilation of phrases that seem to help me guide me in my thinking, how someone comes through on the page, the grammar, syntax, vocabulary, tone, point of view, rhythm of a particular person, the rhetoric and the rhetorical mix of those. It's an expression of you, it's individual style. None of those sounds too unattainable to me. They mm -hmm. sound quite attainable. And I think that's what fascinated me most about this word cloud that I started to see developing when I looked in those references. And 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 so I think we can agree that it's an expression of us. Would you, what, what do you think? What do you think it is? How would you define it, Albert? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> and, uh, I, I think it's really about um, trusting our observations in the world. Beautiful. You know, I love that. Really kind of, you know, being intuitive about like, oh, what am I drawn to? Uh, both like visually, you know, um, auditorily, um, all of our senses, you know, and really trusting that sensory impression that it's real and that it's meaningful and that as it's filtered through you, your expression back onto the page will have value, will have meaning, will have you kind of interwoven. So I, I kind of think that's where, where it begins. I love that. And then you can think about, I'm looking just at my desk. I'm just looking at the things that I can see. And I'm looking at the great Caroline Knapp's book, Drinking, A Love Story. Mm -hmm. oh, now yeah. there's right in the title, an expression of voice, right? Mm -hmm. That, as you just said so well, trusting your outlook, right? What is your outlook? If drinking to you was a love story, oh, at, that title remains one of the best titles of any memoir ever. But it's mm -hmm. also her point of view. It's her self. It's her vision of drinking. It's a, It was a love story. And those are real hard to walk away from, aren't they? So sure. trusting your intuition, trusting that when you see somebody and maybe you don't, um, you know, you have to describe something and you initially fall back on a cliche, but you know perfectly well that in the final version, you're going to have to excise that's cliche and use what you really think what is she really how best to describe her so that we get her not height weight and eye color what is she is she what and i think that's that's just beautiful what you said and i get that completely trusting your intuition you have these impressions and they form metaphor right in your head and simile and go with it right yeah and then it comes to your your sensibilities for what you're drawn to reading. And that's where we really learn. And that's where we really start to garner voice from reading other people's voices, other people's yes. points of views, other people's observations, right? And allowing yourself, especially at the beginning, to, to mimic, to copy, mm -hmm. you know? Not to plagiarize, don't ever do that. But yeah, you, you like a particular style, trust that. Like, what do you love? Like, I was completely obsessed with Hart Crane mm -hmm. when I first started writing poetry. Now, I didn't know why, really, except, you know, it sort of unveiled itself slowly over time. That there was something about the, the lusciousness of the imagery and, and the sort of weird complication of the, 
the sounds and the the it was just so weird and strange and beautiful to me mm -hmm. and i was like i want to do that you know i want to write like hard crane mm -hmm. <laughs> so i tried to like write like hard crane and uh and that was fine because i can't write hard crane poems i can only write albert's interpretation of hard crane poems which have some of me in them right and they have my voice that gets sort of strained through as it were um so i think some people do worry about like oh am i sounding too much like blah 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 mm -hmm. um, take it in digest it metabolize it and know that your experience your sensibilities your insights are going to filter through and color what comes out on the page after reading somebody else and after loving and appreciating them that's lovely. And I agree with you. I think imitation is the strongest form of, or the most sincere form of flattery, as the <laughs> quote goes. Um, I yeah. My experience was with Emily Dickinson. And mm -hmm. Emily Dickinson knocked my little nine-year-old head back to the point where I became uh, obsessed and mm -hmm. studying. And what I really was picking up on was the way she used words next to one another. And doing mm -hmm. a lot of research as an adult, and now I go to her home regularly. It's it's in Amherst, Massachusetts, and it's a, it's a wonderful place to visit. But having read a bunch of biographies and understanding that she would cut words out of magazines and put them next to one another, that the way the propinquity of language also was mm -hmm. a very big part of her voice the sound internal rhyming and the the way some things look angular together on the page and all of that really drove my own word choices ultimately mm -hmm. but i don't write like emily dickinson but her she helped to uplift my own voice because she gave me more courage to look at how language sounds and appears on the page so yeah exactly. i think you can you can filter it you can but first you get inspired by somebody else's so I guess the question for everybody who's listening in is, you know, where they want to locate, define, cultivate, keep and grow that voice. So you've got this beautiful system that's writing as a path to awakening where you propose this embodied interconnected approach to creativity and writing. So what would if you if if everybody could ask the same question and I'm sure they're going to have lots of different ones, but what would you propose these kind people do right now today? Can you what can you identify as a good first step? You talked about getting quiet, but let's dig into that a little bit. I, I'm not so sure anyone knows how to be quiet anymore. <laughs> you know, short of a martini and a lie down, like what else have you got? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's so so curious how challenging it is to to be silent, to be with ourselves in stillness and silence. But in my experience, I just have to say, it's it's nothing short of profound. It's the simplest thing. And it's not easy. It seems like, what could be easier than sitting and doing nothing, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But it turns out that if you're not used to it, if you spend a lot of time like I did, uh, just constantly stimulated and constantly distracting yourself and engaged with various addictions, be it food, sex, money, uh, drugs, alcohol, whatever, then, you know, you can just get caught in a total alternative reality. But what being silent and still helps with is coming back to the self, coming back to what's true, what's real, um, what's immediate. And, you know, if we get too kind of caught off in our heads and, and um, by all the shiny objects, we lose touch with our authenticity, with our true sense of observation and, and sensory cultivation. So I th think it's important just to start simply if you haven't been a meditator, if you haven't explored any contemplative practices, is to, to start with a few minutes of just being still and being mm -hmm. silent. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be sitting meditation. Uh, it could be standing meditation eyes closed, turning inward, and simply breathing a few conscious breaths, noticing what's stirring in your body. Um, that's really kind of where I like to begin. Great. And so that every day they could do this for a few minutes. They could just say, this is part of my writing practice. It's possible that I could just spend a few still minutes 
to maybe let stuff in or let stuff out um, is just is just another way to acknowledge that this is the beginning of my writing day or um, the beginning of my writing week. But I think every day would be a nice thing to incorporate if you can get still and look and I mean get still and, and listen. I think that there's a, a piece of it for me. There's also this idea getting back to what you said originally of trusting your intuition is then when you open your eyes, when you go out into the world is the, the question really is what do you see and mm -hmm. what is it on, from your point of view through your set of eyes with your pathology on you, whether that pathology be the product of a happy supportive home or an unhappy unsupportive home where meager encouragement was given. What do you see when you look at the people in the car next to you? What do you see when you go to the, the look at a painting? What do you see when you consider writing about your child's face? What is it that you, with all of your pathology on you, see? And I think getting quiet at the first thing in the morning is going to allow you then to open your eyes to and be faithful to this idea of what your intuition is interpreting this experience. Because I think writers forget especially new writers forget that there's yes. a voice we want to hear. I want to hear your take on it. I do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we just have to remind ourselves that, that every single one of us is absolutely unique, mm -hmm. you know, and even if, you know, like, I, and I always talk about this because, you know, when I was writing, working on writing this path to awakening, it was like, oh God, do we really need yet another self-help book? Do we need like, do we need another self-help book around writing even? Do we need another writing book? I could have talked myself out of that so easily, right? Because mm -hmm. Natalie Goldberg is just one example of someone who she's like done it. Like, what can I possibly add to that? And what I came to was I can add me, right? Because I've had totally different experiences than Natalie Goldberg or whoever. Mm -hmm. I've had totally different um, observations. There's different things that I notice. There's different things that I digest. There's different things that I metabolize in my own way. And so some people are going to get one thing from her and they're going to get a different thing from me. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, you know, what makes any nonfiction book interesting is your personal stories and anecdotes of how you came to this subject. And so trusting that those have potential to be meaningful, I think is important. And that's all part of voice. Mm -hmm. Trusting that these observations can be meaningful is the huge piece of cultivating this voice, I think. Um, trusting that people say to me all the time, and we talked about this in the last episode of Let Me Introduce You, people say, oh, you know, it, it's another recovery memoir. I mean, you know, what? <laughs> Come on. And I say, no, no. <laughs> That's what the bookstore categories are for. <laughs> That's why there's a recovery section and you want to contribute to the conversation. Your voice is what's missing. I look at those shelves as missing my book if I haven't written the book, right? Mm -hmm. You want to look at the start looking at those shelves as missing your voice, your take on drinking, your take on drugging if it's a recovery memoir, your take mm -hmm. on sex addiction, your take on whatever addiction. That's missing my voice, which is the voice of someone who and fill in the blank. How do you define yourself? What is your psychiatric demographic per se, you know, your your take on it, your outlook on it. And it is missing your voice until you write the book, which is why we give the advice to writers all the time, write the book that you want to read or write the book that you can't find. Right, so exactly. I look at those shelves, I don't find my voice up there. I, 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 that's my first cue that there's a book to be written. What do you think? Oh, totally. Well, and, um, and it doesn't have to be filled with absolute terror and drama no nope. you know that just happened to be my experience <laughs> <laughs> sorry just laughing along fun. with you albert trust me nobody <laughs> right i wish i had fun nobody and you know right now i'm reading uh, shirley hazard's memoir about graham green and yes it's so um it's so completely like 
I don't even know how to describe it. It's, I'm, I, I have to be honest, I'm not that enthralled. It's a little arcane and uh, intellectual, sort of British intellectual from a certain era, but it takes place on Capri. And so mm -hmm. I can go to Capri in my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of fun to be there with these literary types from that era, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s. And you learn, you start to get to know Shirley Hazard through her appreciation and her relationship with Graham Greene. And is she getting into all this stuff about her family? No. But her observations of him and the other literary people around it gives you this really uh, intimate sense of her voice and her experience. That's lovely. Yeah, so I, that's kind of a totally yeah. different take on memoir. Absolutely. And and I I have a, a podcast called QWERTY and I'm about 95 episodes into it. The one that's out right this moment is Iris Smiles. She's been published in The New Yorker. She was a mm -hmm. semifinalist for the uh, Thurber American Humor Award. Now, I have rarely read anyone with a voice, never read anyone with a voice like hers. Mm -hmm. Her voice is eccentric, you might say, quirky. See, I don't know say. her. Iris Smiles? Iris Smiles. She's a New Yorker, Atlantic, um, and she's just published her third book called Droll Tales that is brilliant. She is unique in that she has a way of looking at the world that she's very comfortable with so that when she, when her mother told her, um, you better change up the way you do things, you're getting kind of past the, you know, date where anyone's going to marry you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. took herself on a science cruise because she loves particle physics. <laughs> she just happens to love it. And mm -hmm. um, she took herself on a science cruise. She went and uh, thinking she might meet some people. Unfortunately, everybody was out of her age range, but she had the most wonderful time. And what she ends up doing with the piece is explaining that all matters, particles of matter move, and some of them all, some of them attract another one. Electrons travel together, but she refers to herself as the Higgs boson, which is a particle that's known to be a singular <laughs> particle that travels through space on its own. She uses all the things she loves about particle physics to explain in the piece, and the piece is about 400 words long. I've linked it in the in the transcript of the the, the interview. Um, because I want people to look at her voice. She's a hell of a quirky thinker. Mm -hmm. And everybody eats up her prose wherever, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, I've read her in the Times. I've been reading her for, I don't know, since the middle teens, I think. But mm -hmm. her voice is one of a confidence that what interests her might just interest you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's enough, right? Yes. She sees herself as the Higgs boson, may not be, the way you see yourself, but how do you see yourself? Because I want to know as a reader. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just I just love that. I absolutely love that. And I love the fact that you can palpably see it in others, but we also don't know that we have one of our own. And of course we do have a voice. So let's talk about this, this return on investment that people can get of doing this quiet work, two minutes, three minutes, a little bit of quiet work, maybe before they start writing maybe before they get out of bed. I don't know. Have you got a preferred place where you get quiet vis-a-vis -vis when you start writing, Albert? Yeah, I mean, it varies um, depending on when I'm working on a project. Like right now, I'm, I'm in sort of editing mode, um, so I'm not in generative mode. But I do love to be quiet before when I'm in generative mode to kind of open up the channels and reconnect to that sort of vast, mysterious, empty space of creativity that I know is out there when I get quiet. Um, because it's not always, I don't want it to be about me imposing my will upon the page. That's not as interesting to me as, um, as just honestly, the mystery of being. Um, so if I can get quiet, it, it kind of reconnects to a wider birth of possibility. Mm, that's and, interesting. Yeah, and then, you know, I I always like to meet the page via free writing. And, you know, the, the whole thing about free writing where you just, you know, set the timer and go. And, mm -hmm. you know, take your pen off the page or your fingers off the keys for 
you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes or however long you want. And if you're in a completely sort of blah zone, you just write blah, 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 blah for literally 10 minutes. And you'll, what you'll find probably, um, and you have to find out for yourself, but what you'll probably find is that a thought will enter in and you'll write that thought and that'll lead to another one. And, and if you're really true to it around the energy and the um, urgency, you know, you'll write something unexpected. Mm -hmm. You know, we do free writing every Friday in my uh, community and people write the most mind blowing stuff constantly, the most beautiful stuff. And this is, if you're ever stuck, this is just a, a very simple recipe for, for finding your voice, for reconnecting to your voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's in there. And, and I think that it's, um, it's, it's a bit, well, I'm going to stick on this one for a minute. It's a bit um, more accessible than people think. So when we go looking for it, we might, um, it, I, I thought sometimes say to people, you're trying too hard, right? Go, I'm going, to, mm -hmm. I'm going to go find my voice. Well, how about we try quiet first? How about we try getting to the keyboard or the notebook first? That those are, those are good suggestions that you do for me. And what Iris Smiles told me when I spoke with her and, um, and as I said, she's up on the, the QWERTY podcast right now, was this most recent book, which has done really, really well, Droll Tales. She said what it had started by, she writes every day. She just writes. She just sits down and whatever interests her, she just writes it. And the next day she does the same thing. And a friend of hers, a mentor of uh, old, a bit older writer, um, one day said to her, hmm, Iris, I think you've been writing for about three years. What do you got? And she said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, um, <laughs> Maybe you should go check. <laughs> so she said, and I loved this about the interview. She said, I printed it all out and I started looking at it and I started to see a through line here and there, this piece, that piece, this piece, that piece, and this piece kind of had some similarity. Those other ones did. Okay. Those go over here. And then I started to think, does this interest me? And it does. And it did. And then I started to make the connective tissue and find the one thing in each of those stories or essays, however you want to look at them, um, that interested me and, and really put the blood into those, you know, really squeeze some mm -hmm. life into those things. And but let's be I, clear, that's not, she's not like journaling every day. No, she's journaling just writing. This is sort of like writing into some. Yep. however abstract topic or idea that she's interested in. Yeah, she's more like I am. I'm not a mm -hmm. journaler or a free writer. I'm a, what I call writing with intent. It's the, it's the mm -hmm. signature phrase of everything I do at the memoir project because I just get up and I write and mm -hmm. I'm writing towards something. I'm exploring something. I like the intent of it. I study, if I want to write the modern love column of the New York Times, I'm going to study it like crazy, read 24 of them and try to write one two space with the same tempo the New York Times, you know, produces yes. in that piece. Yes. I'm very much about that kind of writing, but she's mm -hmm. writing. Um, small pieces, as she says to them, that of things that interest her. So they're mm -hmm. on brand and they're in her voice, but then you've got to go string them together. So there are those people who want to free write, and then there are those people who want to do something that's more, um, let's say, intentional. Not that free writing is not intentional. They're just different. So I think I wanted to make that point that every writer can do it, whatever you're doing, do it your way, right? Say yes. This may be part of a book. I'm just going to, I'm kind of interested in family. Maybe some people start out with that. I'm kind of, I'm just going to write for six months, short pieces every day, three pages a day on the subject of family. And then I'm going to see what I've got, which mm. is also a, a way of getting there. But if it's preceded with that quiet thing you suggest, I think the voice might really benefit. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think it's for both and so if you have a project or a general idea, I tend to write into project. And so you can never, I mean, if you, you know, when I'm on a tear and I really know what I want to write and I have my characters and my plot and stuff, uh, I don't necessarily need to, to get silent in order to, to re-enter the project and to, to get into the writing and to find my, my voice. So, uh, but I still sit most every day because it's just, I mean, for a million other reasons beyond mm -hmm. creativity and writing, just for, you know, health and sanity and 
and all of that. And it doesn't have to be sitting. I want to kind of go back for a little a second here. And you know, if you have a lot of wiggy energy in your body, mm -hmm. uh, try walking meditation, but don't put in earbuds and talk to your neighbors. You know, instead try to make it a contemplative meditative walk where mm -hmm. you are sort of turning inward and, and going slowly and being in the non-human elements, you know, with nature and letting that inform your sensibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. And I think before we go back and go into um, and, and start to wrap this up so we can take questions, if we go back to this slide and we look again at, at this whole idea about how do you define voice and and we add that wonderful comment that you started out with in, in it comes from your intuition and how you see things. And so trusting that and trusting that. And I think that's at the core of what we're trying to say here. You are seeing things differently. You are seeing things through the filter of your whole experience. I call it annotation. You know, mm. everything you've ever seen, felt, heard, thought, eaten, listened to is all in there. And suddenly you're in a new situation and you're drawing on all of that. And you're wondering, why the hell am I thinking about the peanut butter sandwich I ate in fourth grade all of a sudden? <laughs> because your annotation is totally at work right then. Mm -hmm. And the thing to say is, I'm listening. What have you got for me? And then trusting that there's a link somewhere that that peanut butter sandwich is trying to make a debut appearance in your work. <laughs> why how why you know pulling from that and trusting it so just just stay with that for a second before we go into what what you have to offer for people but how would you after you've been quiet now you've been free writing now you're turning your attention to the more intentional work and you, these things start to come up these influences these this background you have when you were writing beamish boy you know you sit down to write one scene and 50,000 other scenes come trumpeting into your head and your intuition your voice has to say slow down everybody or i just mm -hmm. want this what we we'll talk about the the practical aspects of of writing with your own voice but also kind of taming the the onslaught of story what do you, what do you, what are your skills there well there's two things at work i mean there's the onslaught that can happen but most people like myself when it comes to memoir are like oh i don't have a great memory I can't really remember all those important things that happened the way, you know, Mary Carr does, right? <laughs> Just to use one example, uh, you know, people remembering what the bassinet looked like when they were one and a half. Mm -hmm. um, that's not really what happens. But what I found was that the more I wrote into it, the more things became available to my memory. Mm -hmm. And um, so as to what to do with, with the onslaught is, I think it's important to, to trust where the energy is around particular scenes. And at the same time, know that what are these scenes that, that, um, that changed you as a character? Because remember, when you're writing memoir, you are the protagonist, you are the main character. And so we kind of want to know what what are these scenes, these situations that that changed you, where you where you evolved. You went from one state of being to a new state of being or a new state of consciousness. Um, so that's one way of sort of filtering out all the thousands of things that that can be included in a in a memoir. You kind of have to hone it down to to a few key scenes. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it'll change, right? And it'll evolve the more you write. Yes. When we, I think when we hear people talk about other writers' voices, we tend to try to characterize them. We say, oh, he has such a muscular voice. Mm -hmm. Oh, she has such a, um, an angry voice. And I always say to people, muscular, I get. Okay, that, he's, a very, he's a writer that's writing with, from a very sure, cocksure point of view really almost on the border of preaching to you it's just really present and big but when somebody's writing an angry piece i say no that's not really voice that's tone that's a different thing they're right now mm -hmm. they're very angry but what's their voice their voice is one that is allowing them to use metaphor and perception that's 
maybe not the way you would see it if you were the one kissing your mother goodbye after you've just put her in the nursing home. A scene mm -hmm. that I had to write when I was very young. My mother was 49 when she got Alzheimer's. There's a mm -hmm. scene in my first book where I'm leaving her in a nursing home. It's almost the, the second to last page of the book. And it's written wow. with my voice, which is the voice of someone who is learning that loving requires letting go. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a strain of poignancy and sentimentality, but there's also a, a strain of confidence in that mm -hmm. voice that I'm doing the right thing. So I'm I think it's it's worth considering that there's a whole lot of, lot of tones that a voice can take. You can be angry, you can be skeptical, you can be that, but your voice itself is more. If if there's a, the way I look at it, if there's and there is a difference between character and personality, voice is your character. And the p individual pieces are written from your personality. And there's there's a character though to each writer that I think that we that we want to talk about a little bit. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Character, personality, is there another way you would put it where you can see the difference so that people can understand that, wow, that's a that's an angry scene, but I don't have an angry voice, right? Yeah, it seems to me it comes down to choices, you know, and going back to what we were talking about earlier like picking i mean you mentioned it here it is on the slide the grammar your grammar choices your syntax choices your vocabulary choices um what's filtering through your eyes um the pacing the musicality of your and this is all coming back to to sensibility and mm -hmm. trusting that that all of those choices that you're making you know i think um, many of us are like, oh, well, what's the right thing to do? I mean, I, know ah. to, I do this, right? You right. think like, what's the right way of doing it? And <laughs> no such there thing. There is no right way. Right. We None of us know what we're doing as writers. And yet somehow we, we get it done. And it, it's a little mysterious, but ultimately we do have to kind of trust those sensibilities and trust our own quirky personality without judgment in order to get it on the page yeah. and um, yeah I, I do think I want to come back to courage because your example uh, and, uh, and I haven't read this and I absolutely want to read it but um, it is really important that you were able to show up on the page with confidence in a very vulnerable and challenging situation and in memoir we have to revisit those emotional states which takes a tremendous amount of courage. And so I, I think that's important to, to re remember and that, that the courage is kind of comes through that voice in a, yeah. in a subtle way. Yeah, I keep a, a quote from Emily Dickinson up on my wall that you know everybody thinks she's this sort of dressed in white, diminutive, quiet, virginal, stay at home. And it's like, no, no, she was none of those things. <laughs> except for the white dress. And she, her, the quote that I keep on my wall says, I took my power in my hand and went against the world. I was mm -hmm. not so much as David had, but I was twice as bold. And yeah. that's Emily. And she, she, you know, she kept a voice that was so provocative, so mm -hmm. illuminative. Um, you know, she's our, I think she's our greatest civil war poet. I, I, she mm -hmm. illuminates for us the horror of what we were doing in this country. She illuminates for us the questions of faith. She was a, a non-believer in a very mm -hmm. um, believing world. And the twice as bold. It's the boldness to say, mm -hmm. even in that vulnerable scene, I have something to say. I have something to say. That's my voice. My voice mm -hmm. wants to be heard. I have something. I have a bold, con, con, I think, uh, a, a boldness in me that says, here is what I saw there. Mm -hmm. Even if it's written from a place of under the couch in tears, here's what I saw there when I witnessed domestic violence when I was eight. Here's what I saw. And, yeah, and, and not to shy away from the, the emotions. Right. You know, the the rage, uh, the the intensity, the fear, the doubt, the worry, the the um, you know, the reclaiming of your power. You know, no matter how inappropriate, quote unquote. Yep. <laughs> uh, claiming all that, 
like words, words, what is that Margaret Atwood say? A word after word after word is power. That's it. That's it. So I want to just briefly get people to go and have a look at, at the things you offer. You offer classes and craft lessons and dynamic online community and coaching and feedback. Because um, I always like to to get under the artist that I'm talking about and say, you know, hey, look, this look at what this person does. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you've got a workshop coming up that you told me about that sounds fabulous on April 29th, um, The Poetry of Truth. And I, I put, um, I'm going to put the link up for everybody. I'm going to give you the link in a minute to Albert's uh, site where there's all this stuff going on. But this sounds like a remarkable thing with a, a dynamic workshop, writing workshop with poet and writer Rosemary Otola Tromer. Yeah, and I don't know if you know her, but she talked about bold and courage. This woman's amazing. She's been writing a poem a day for at least three years. And... Um, and you know it's just it's just coming coming through her and she's totally devoted and has been through just the ringer beyond the pandemic uh just with family stuff and mm -hmm. it, it, she's just remarkable so that's going to be an amazing thing well that should be <laughs> fabulous and everybody should go and have a look at your offerings um here at the website the second link is the classes and I want, uh, you know, everybody go have a look at the site. Is The site has many, many offerings, and the classes include that one that's coming up. Um, so let's turn our attention some, to some questions here. We've got a whole lot of them. And we, I think we, we, um, we've got some of, the, some of it out of the way about trying to define voice. But um, there is a, a, a comment from Jim who says, just keep writing. Your journal as is a trail, providing tangible waypoints. So, what what about that, uh, Albert? In terms of the the morning pages, or the journaling, or the free writing, um, in terms of that helping you find your voice. Anything else that you want to say about the Jim calls them the tangible waypoints? Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. I think that's great. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> that's terrific. Yeah, um, it's beautiful. <laughs> You know, the, the only challenge is if you do decide at some point that you want to to write some kind of a, a project or, um, you know, memoir or whatever it might be, a novel, a book of poems, et cetera, is to, is, is to kind of sort of, I don't know if I should use the word evolve out of that, you know, because sometimes we can get kind of just immersed in our journals and mm -hmm. and we just have the same sort of complaining voice that just comes out on the page like oh, when he did that thing to me again da, da, blah 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 and so it i think it's important and powerful i love journaling don't get me wrong i think it's incredible and it's just different than than it, it's a different kind of voice once you go into into a genre i think it's all i really want to say there but i think mm -hmm. it's a really powerful way to enter in yeah Absolutely. So Kit asks, uh, I like Albert's comment about trusting our observations as a way of finding our voice, but I find it hard to describe what my voice is when asked, unless something obvious like chiclet, snarky, <laughs> neither of mm -hmm. which I'm fond of. Any mm -hmm. pointers on that? So are we talking about just, so she's talking about describing her own voice. How do you then say to someone, how do you pitch yourself short of your writing? You know, obviously the best way is to actually just let your writing speak for you. But mm -hmm. if you have to define your own voice, how would you define your voice, Albert? I would, I would, yeah, don't. <laughs> and don't worry about what other people are, are thinking or how they're defining your voice. You know, I've never really felt compelled to, to do that. Um, yeah, I think the writing needs to speak for you. Um, yeah. And I think you, this gets back to your original point about you can't buy it, you can't be taught it, you have to work on it. You have to mm -hmm. be the, the conf, confident in your intuitions and write what you see. If you see somebody and in a phrase, and I don't want to put phrases in anybody's heads, but if you describe somebody in a phrase that's unique, quirky, different, but descriptive, there's your voice. Mm hmm yeah, and everyone, you know, there's going to be a million different interpretations of your voice from the mm -hmm. external. I mean, this gets into a whole thing about reviews and the people, but I, I don't think that you don't want to worry about that. 
you really want to devote yourself to telling the truth as you mm -hmm. experience the truth. And I think that's it. Telling the truth as you experience the truth may be the closest thing we've come to in terms of defining voice. Telling the mm -hmm. truth the way you experience the truth. And remembering that there was another version out there of your story is always a good thing to remember. Your sister, your brother, your parents, whatever. Mm -hmm. But telling your truth the way you see the truth is your voice. And if there are, again, metaphors and similes, descriptors, what do you see this as? How do you view these people that you're writing about? Um, and I think that's it. We haven't really talked about place, but place is a huge definer of voice. It can be a huge definer of voice. In what way? Um, well, I have, I can think of two um, shining examples in, in my community of um, women from Texas, different places in, in Texas. And they, what they notice in that, in the landscape, um, how they phrase things um, from that sort of Texas, <laughs> I'm not, I can't really articulate because I'm not from Texas, I haven't really spent any time there. But they just have a, a, you know, it comes back to syntax and um, style and, uh, you know, Mary Carr gets into this quite a bit in, um, in her fabulous book on memoir because she's from East Texas. Um, but, you know, I think it's just important to, to reflect on place. Where do you come from? What's the vernacular of that place? You know, I sort of have, I grew up in Connecticut, New York, so I have this sort of blue blood suburban New York, something or other that colors my voice. Um, and I wanted to, frankly, I wanted to um, distance myself from that. I was a little bit ashamed and embarrassed of that. And it wasn't until I wrote my memoir that I was able to claim that and just be like, yeah, this is part of who I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, you know, the kid who went to California and became a deadhead. <laughs> so that too. <laughs> Well, I think you make a really good point because if you go someplace outside of yourself, and which I think is the, the best place to go, I'm I'm a huge believer in counterphobia, for instance, writing really into what scares you most. Mm, You're going yeah. to bring your full self to it. So I'm a New Yorker. You can hear it in my accent. But my husband is from South Dakota and all of his people are Midwestern. So when I was confronted with my first Indiana funeral that was many, many, many different kinds of jello. I knew I had myself a personal <laughs> lesson because I, and I didn't want to just look down on the food. That wasn't it. I was literally flummoxed by the difference between appetizer jello, entree jello, and dessert <laughs> jello. And right. <laughs> they did not see it that way. It was clear mm -hmm. as jello to them what the difference was. And so, when you are confronted by something outside of your Connecticut patrician blue blood out upbringing is the best place to recognize your voice because I was able to bring my sensibility, my sense of place, my sense of humor, my sense of food, my sense of health, like why would anyone eat jello? You know, all that to this, but but you don't want to just criticize. Like what right, was the exactly, point of the piece? Exactly. So I think that's a really good place too. It's not always looking in the mirror. It's actually looking at somebody else's experience and bringing your eyes to it. I that think. is such a brilliant example. Such a great Thank example. you. I just, just popped into my head. I've written extensively about my in-laws, Jello. It's a, it's a big <laughs> theme in our family. <laughs> I love it. It's got me it. a lot of uh, territory. So Dorothy asked about heart brain. Yes, Dorothy, that is the spelling, H-A-R-T-C-R-A-N-E. Absolutely. And the poetry is positively worth reading. Um, we've got, uh, Jim asks, finding your, writing, finding your writing spot physically, that place is a sacred one, as Twyla Tharp notes, making it a creative habit. I think so. I think where you go mm -hmm. to write needs to be, I, I refer to it in my book, you must be hospitable to your talent, meaning you've got to keep that space clean so you can get there. Because most of the writers I work only have 45 minutes a day or an hour or mm -hmm. two hours a day to work. What about you? Have you got a, a reverence for the space you work in? And does it help with your voice, Albert? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it really depends on where I am and what I'm writing. But uh, most of the writing happens on my sofa in my little great, great room upstairs. And it's... um. 
it's just an extremely pleasant place. I'm surrounded by my books. There's great light. I'm comfortable. I'm engaged. I'm connected. And um, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, we need to kind of cultivate that and create our little altar and have our, our photos of Walt and Emily and Hart Crane and whoever else, all of our muses around us yep, cheering us do. on. <laughs> That's right. Emily cheering me on every day. Valerie asks, I've read many, and it seems to be the case over and over in a premise that gets picked up, but my memoir, although touches on sexual molestation, is not this, and hmm, not sure what you're asking, and leaves me out of the running. I have my voice, but this salacious trend is stopping me from getting notice. Will this trend that seems to be the most sought after eventually end so other voices have a chance? Um, oh, I see, we were missing that first line. Got it. Here, let me start again. There is a trend in memoir of alcohol, drug abuse, and recovery, as well as sex worker memoirs, all of which with a salacious tone. I read many, and it seems to be the case over and over, and a premise that gets picked up. My memoir, although it touches on sexual molestation, is not this, and leaves me out of the running. Oh, because it doesn't have a salacious tone. Uh -huh. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I think that you absolutely have a place on the shelves. Um, I've read a lot of sex worker memoir that doesn't have a salacious tone that has a, mm -hmm. a call for advocacy for understanding um, that sex workers are workers too and things like that. So I wouldn't give up, Valerie. Um, I think uh, you ask if this trend will 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 be over. I would look for a publisher who's looking more for um, something that's from a more spiritual place or a more accepting place. Um, and isn't looking for the salacious. There's lots of publishers that have room for, for more memoir on this. What do you think, Albert? Absolutely. No, I totally agree. And just to be totally devoted to your story and your style and not worry about what's going on out there. Because you just don't know. Once you, you just have to stay totally devoted to your voice and your story and, yeah. and what's meaningful for you. And uh, you know, what happens externally with the readers and the, it's out of your hands. It's out of yeah. your control. And Absolutely. Then... Victoria asks that I just say in a bit more about writing with intent. So Victoria, it's the fundamental principle of everything at the memoir project. I don't believe in exercises and writing prompts. I never give them, <laughs> never have. Everybody's different. And yeah. I think that's great. I come from the New York Times. You get an assignment, you get it done. So mm -hmm. my theory is you study the form you want to write in, you write in that form, you master that form, and you publish in that form. If you want to read, if you want to write the, the modern love column for the New York Times, three of my clients have published it, you study dozens of them. And you spend mm -hmm. those few precious moments a day that you have not on writing exercises and prompts, but on actually intent with intent learning the form you're going to publish in. Um, yeah. Jan asks, yeah. what do you think, Albert? Is that? No, I, I, I think that's great. I'm a big prompt guy, um, mm -hmm. but only if you're stuck, because I totally agree with you. Like once you make a commitment, you know, and you write with intent, just go for it. Stop. You know, there's no room for prompts because every day you have your prompt is to write that next scene in your story. <laughs> that's right. your prompt. That's your, so, that's your motivation. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So Jan asks, what I'm hearing is that in order to develop your voice, you need to put butt in the chair every day and write something. Eventually, a, a voice will emerge. Jan, I couldn't have said it better. Albert? Yeah, there it is. That's it, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know, Jan. Jan cuts through. I, we could get a t-shirt, Jan, that says Jan cuts through. That's great. <laughs> I so CJ asks, I'm writing a memoir about my teenage years. It's intentionally written in my teenage voice. Any tips to help me better step into that? Albert, what do you got? Oh, gosh. Hang out with teenagers, you know, right. and, and talk to some of your, um, I mean, because now the teenagers now, of course, are going to talk very differently. But it's still, I think it's it's helpful to be around that energy. And then it will help you kind of cast backwards to when you were a teenager and to, to re-enter that voice. Um, and maybe connect if you can from people from a long time ago, you know, close friends from your teenage years. Yeah. And and kind of hash over some memories. It might bring back some vernacular. Perfect. Do the reporting. That's it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Andrea, and we're going to start wrapping this up, but not without this one. Andrea says, in a piece I wrote about the Navajo poet Lucy Tapahanso's work, I define the poet's voice as, quote, the presence that reaches through the words to relate to the audience and subsumes the specific voices that the poet creates. Ooh. Mm. Wow. Can I love that. Borrow that? <laughs> Andrea. Great. Yeah, Andrea, awesome. you've got a voice. I, I'm, I'm not worried about Andrea's voice at all. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. That's a really way, great way of saying it. Right. And Rosie asks, what about voice in past, present, and future in general? It is always the me writing now i say you're writing you're writing now you you're writing from where you are even if you're covering yourself at eight years old or six years old your voice is immutable but i don't know albert mm -hmm. you yeah i mean this gets into a whole another um concept around scene writing mm -hmm. you know one place one time versus summary um and there's gonna be a little bit of different tone because uh, the summary is now, right? Um, and but the scene might be from 1972, and so the voice is going to be a little bit different, right? And the dialogue is going to be different. But ultimately, mm -hmm. the overarching voice is going to be you carrying forth the the threads of the story. Yeah. And as we wrap this up, we'll just do this one more um, because it just ties right in there. Andrea says, can the same writer have different voices when writing in different genres? Is there something about an author's voice that is unchangeable regardless of genre? I, I would say that mm -hmm. when I certainly when I write not nonfiction, when I write and I've written uh, books that are purely from a nonfiction reportorial voice, it's very different than when I write memoir because you want to leave the me out of it for the most part. Um, when I'm writing from a, I, I did a book on forensic science and I'm, I, I'm really trying to deliver the subject to you. And I'm, when I write memoir, there's much more of my pathology in the language. Mm -hmm. um, Albert, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I write in multiple genres. So I, I write poetry, memoir, nonfiction. I'm working on this gigantic novel project right now, which is through uh, it's a historical fiction piece with some real life stuff and memoir in it. Um, so I'm having to write in someone else's voice completely. There you go. Wow. Which is really interesting. And I, it'll be curious to see if there's something of me in there. I mean, there, <laughs> <laughs> there has to be, right? Yes. <laughs> there's this, this being, um, but... Yeah, so I think they're they're sort of the essence of the person, but I think it's exciting to to challenge yourself by by trying to broaden your voice as as much as possible, and and writing in different genres helps you do that. Well, that's good advice, and we'll have to leave it there for today. Thank you, Albert. That was a really fun conversation for me. I hope it was good for everybody else. I promised everybody we'd be out of here in an hour. I know we went a few minutes over, but I oh hope you thought it was worth it. Thank you. Marian, you, you are amazing. Me. Thank you so, so much. This was really fun and uh, appreciate everyone for tuning in. Well, thank you. And everybody else, we'll be back next month with some more. And I so wish you a happy writing day and life. Come see me at the Memoir Project at marionroach.com. Go see Albert. You've got his, oops, we've got, we've got his, uh, I just, I think I just, I'm just going to look for your, here we go. Here's the, uh, the slide with your links on it. And um, we'll see you all again soon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.